Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amma ba'd. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce you to a brand new show and a brand new podcast called The Hot Seat. To understand a little bit more about The Hot Seat, we first have to understand the context of the modern day world we find ourselves living in, in the year 2019. It is a world in which perhaps, perhaps there are more doubts, misconceptions and misinterpretations that are thrown around about the religion of Islam than in any other period of time in the history of mankind. The internet is a number one source used by people globally to acquire information on any topic and it is riddled and full of false notions and erroneous ideologies about the deen of Allah Our kids, ourselves are being exposed to this kind of information on a daily and if not daily then at the very least weekly basis and whether we know it or not, whether we choose to accept it or not, it is having an effect on ourselves, our hearts our minds and ultimately our understanding of this beautiful religion. To further complicate the problem, many of us find ourselves living in Western societies where the governments and the social norms and pressures are constantly trying to redefine what is good and what is bad, what is accepted and what is rejected, what Islam is and is allowed to be and what Islam is never allowed to be. All of this, my brothers and sisters, ultimately leads to confusion, at least to ignorance and if Allah permits, it can lead to misguidance. The hot seat has therefore been designed with the permission of Allah alone to counter these kind of modern day contemporary issues head on by using the knowledge and the guidance of the Muslims of the past, the early generations of Muslims, the best of generations. There's not a single Muslim on the face of the planet today that would doubt the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completed our religion for us over 1400 years ago. And that that completed, holistic, perfect religion is just as applicable now in the year 2019 as it was back then. We truly do have classical solutions for contemporary problems. However, this isn't your normal average Islamic lecture series. First of all, it's not a lecture. It's a discussion between two parties, often opposing parties, in an attempt to reach the truth. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it's a unique, one-of-its-kind interactive podcast where you, from the comfort of your own home, have the opportunity to vote for and to choose the topic we'll be discussing on the show. You also have the chance to ask your own questions on these contemporary issues and to grill the speaker if you feel like he hasn't been grilled enough on the show itself. I'll be releasing details of how you can do both of those things at the end of this episode. But for now, without any further ado, let's get into this episode of The Hot Seat. وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعَجَبْ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ustad Abdul Rahman, welcome to the hot seat. Thank you very much for joining me today. So, this, as you know, is episode one. And as I mentioned in the introduction, it's talking about contemporary issues that we're dealing with in the year 2019, the modern day world. And actually, this was actually your idea. You approached me with this to have this kind of podcast dealing with the modern day issues. Do you want to tell a bit more about why you think this is important for the Muslims in 2019? الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد As you know the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم told us that there's going to come trials and tribulations as time, time goes on and we get closer to the hour the problems that the Ummah are going to be going through, the groups that are going to be formed, the ideologies that are going to be presented. The Prophet already told us, he prophesied this 1,400 and something years ago. And he didn't just prophesize that they're going to come problems and they're going to come deviated and misguided concepts. But rather he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he clarified, he explained the way out of it. And how is 
uh, a Muslim meant to deal with those ideologies and those beliefs and those misconceptions. So I've seen Sahatu Da'wah, what's taking place in the Da'wah scene, and I don't want to say people haven't responded to these ideologies and these groups, and Alhamdulillah, good work has been done, mm. and efforts have been exerted in that regard, but I've not yet seen, this is my humble opinion, uh, someone who's taken these issues, these uh, uh, contemporary problems, and then responded from a classical uh, textual evidence. Mm. They, they didn't come with anything new, but they used the Qur'an, uh, they used the Sunnah, they used the statement of the early generation, who we believe in our tradition, that they are the most noble and most righteous. As the Prophet said in the hadith, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ So, which means, uh, the best of generation is my generation, and those who come, and those who come after. So, since they're the best, the khayriya, the virtue that's connected to these people, is not just their actions and uh, as many people believe, that how they prayed, how, how they read Qur'an, but also in terms of their knowledge, mm. and the knowledge that they possessed. So what I wanted to do is take all of these groups, whether they are within Islam or outside Islam, mm -hmm. and uh, debunk their misconceptions, uh, respond and dismantle their beliefs, all based upon nusus al wahyain textual evidences from the Qur'an, from the Sunnah, and from the statements of the early generation. That's why I thought a podcast that could do that is greatly needed. Because as you know, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he responded to just about every group at his time, whether they were groups within Islam or whether they were groups outside Islam. He responded to them. And he really responded to them with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. He proved that the answers are within those two. And so I want to bring back to the young youths who are studying in academic universities, who are learning psychology, they are learning philosophy, they are learning these, these doubts have been brought to them and presented to them. I want to give them the thiqa, the confidence that their answers is not far-fetched. It's actually right under their nose. It's in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So that's why I think, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair. I think from a personal perspective, one thing that I'm really looking forward to is having some user interaction. So the fact that the viewers at home get to vote for which topic we're going to be discussing on certain episodes and the fact that this is a podcast and it's not a lecture. So you have the opportunity to go into detail, more detail than you have for a lecture. So as you know, um, this is episode one. So we haven't released the vote and it was a topic that we're going to discuss today that we chose or specifically I chose and presented to you. And that is, who can you trust in the modern day da'wah scene? Mm -hmm. And the reason why this is a contemporary issue, because the advent of social media has allowed many, many people to speak about Islam. And that can bring some good and it can also bring some bad. And the purpose of today is to discuss those good things and those bad things and how we can be careful and how we should be cautious in terms of who we take our knowledge from. So the first question I'll ask you is why is this even important? Why do we need to be cautious from who we take knowledge from? So before I answer your question, there's one thing, a disclaimer that I want to put out there for everybody, inshallah ta'ala. Um, all of the topics, not just this session, inshallah ta'ala, but every single topic that we have, uh, I, I really want the listeners, those who are watching, inshallah ta'ala, that if they have a deep-rooted negative belief, if they have a dark perception of a topic that we're going to, ha that we're going to speak about or we're going to handle, and they've got a preconceived notion, that they come, inshallah ta'ala, with a clear mind. Okay. That they come with a clear mind and they put aside everything that they believed before and they really look at what we're trying to bring, the evidences and the proofs that we're, we're trying to provide and our arguments, all based on their merits mm. and all based upon its authenticity and the, the way that we extract the rulings and we deduct the arguments from it. So. That's something I want, inshallah ta'ala. And I wouldn't want somebody to come and believe something first. And when they do come to the discussion, all they're trying to look for is flaws in the argument or flaws in our discussion. Because if you're trying to do that, then I can reassure you now, we will have that. We will have that because we're humans. The poet said, وَمَنْ دَلَّذِي تُرْضَى سَجَايَاهُ كُلُّهَا كَفَ الْمَرْءِ نُبْلٍ أَنْ تُعَدَّ مَعَيِّبُ Who is the person that when he speaks, he doesn't do mistakes? But the virtue of a person is that their mistakes are countable. Um, so, 
uh, that's the first thing that I request, inshallah ta'ala, that you don't have any psychological resistance, that inshallah ta'ala, you give this podcast a chance to hear our arguments. Okay. In response to your question, the dangers of innovation and also the people of innovation, it stems from the meaning of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. And as you know, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah is the foundation of our religion. Yeah. When a person comes into Islam, that's the first thing that they are told to say. They are told to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. The part that concerns this podcast is Muhammadur Rasulullah. What does it mean when somebody says, I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? What he's saying in essence is that I follow him in everything, in all my speech, in all my actions. I follow Nabi Muhammad in my belief system. In simple terms, you're saying I'm upon his sunnah, his way. Sunnah means the way of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. And so when you say I'm upon the way of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, you're also saying I am, I am against the way that is opposite to his way, the newly introduced ways. So you connect yourself to his sunnah and you also show allegiance to the people who are holding on to that sunnah with you. You have love for them. And you also free yourself from innovation and the people who uh, come with innovation. You free yourself from them. And we're going to be using terms like a sunnah, so it's good to understand it now which means the Prophet's way والسلام, and his tradition, his speech, his actions. Sunnah means ما أضيف إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من قول أو فعل أو تقرير أو صفة خلقية أو خلقية. It is whatever is attributed to the Prophet in terms of speech, action, consent, the Prophet's character and the way he looked عليه والسلام. All of that is, is a sunnah. That's what sunnah means. And innovation means everything that was introduced into the religion without any pre-example. There's no example that came before it. Uh, meaning this person bought it either themselves or someone within Islamic history, he introduced it into Islam. It wasn't practiced at the time of the Messenger والسلام, It was not practiced at the time of the companions. That's an innovation. I, I want to say quickly, and we're going to speak about that in more great details, inshallah ta'ala. There's one hadith that the Messenger والسلام, advised his companions. And this is basically the hadith of Irbad ibn Sariya. Ashab al-Sunnah narrated it that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ba'du Ashabi Sunnah narrated it, that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he advised his companions, he said, Irbad, the companion said, Wa'adana Rasulullah, the Messenger gave us a farewell. Like just a farewell advice. Wa'adana Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mawa'idha, wajilat minha al-quroob, wa darafat minha al uyun It really, our heart trembled from the Prophet's words, and the eyes started to water. <laughs> it was like it was a farewell, like the last speech, like if you're about to die. So we said to him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, give us a wasiyah. The Messenger mentioned here three usul, three foundations, three fundamental principles. The first foundation is that you come with monotheism, tawheed, and you come with following the Messenger. That's the first foundation. The second foundation is that you stick to the jama'ah. You stick to the jama'ah. The jama'ah here means you follow the way of the companions. Okay? You follow the way of the companions. And you stick with the Muslim leader. That you don't uprise and you don't protest and you don't demonstrate against the Muslim leader. Okay? And you hear and you obey him. Of course, غير معصيتين. As long as he doesn't command you something that which is haram. The third asal is الحذر من البدع والمحدثات الأمور. Stay away from innovation and also the innovators. The, the Prophet warned us against this. So this hadith, it talks about three foundations that the people of the Sunnah hold on to. And this is like one of the last statements of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, or it was one of his final farewell statements, salawatullahi wasalamu alayhi. So what you're saying is actually a piece of prophetic advice to advise us to be careful of innovators and to stay away from them. Sahih, that is exactly what the Prophet sallallahu did. I mean, if I could still build up upon that a, a, a bit more. If you actually ponder on the Qur'an and also the Sunnah, you will find that it's built upon two foundations. It's built upon a ta'seelul haqqi wa bayan. To place a foundation. To clarify the truth. To tell the people what is right and what Allah wants and what pleases Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the first foundation. The second foundation is that our 
religion stands on is التحريرو من الباطل بكل أشكال warning against evil in all of its forms warning against innovation warning against sins warning even from the sinners warning against what? the innovators this is what our religion it stands on and it's sad because what you see nowadays is people who just they like to please others they like to please other people or veneration and glorification of particular individuals prevents them from, ha from wanting to say the truth and what is right they actually see that which is wrong it's right in front of them but they won't say anything they'll say what's it got to do with me and so I wanted to remind them a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, Imam At-Tirmidhi narrated it, Ibn Majah, and also Al-Hakim narrated it in his Mustadrak, in hadith Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, that the Messenger ﷺ, he said, Ala la yamna anna. The Prophet said, do, do not let one of you prevent him, rajulan haybatun nasi, the veneration and the glorification of the people. You're trying to honor a particular Imam, you're trying to honor a particular community. So because of that, you choose not to say the truth. Don't let it stop you from what? And يَقُولَ بِحَقٍ To say the truth. إِذَا عَلِمَهُ when you, when, you, when you know that this is the, the way Allah wants. You know that this is what Allah commanded. You know this is what Allah prohibited. Just because of the people, don't withhold it. Say it. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, when the Prophet said that, he cried. The narrator of the hadith, the companion, he cried. And look what he said. He said, وَقَدْ وَاللَّهِ By Allah. By Allah. قَدْ رَأَيْنَا We saw أَشْيَاءَ Fahibna, we saw things that were done in our presence, but we chose to not speak against it because of veneration of people and glorification of people. And so this Sahabi recognized it, it touched him. I hope that this can do it for a lot of people out there who now are just really concerned about how many followers do I have, how many people are with me, you know, that they measure their da'wah and the success of their da'wah on how many people follow them. And inshallah, I think we'll speak about that in great details, inshallah ta'ala. But I, I think that should be the foundation of our podcast. That really, we're not here right now in these podcasts to really please anyone. Mm. And I always say to people, it's not about concealing and withholding the message. That's not what Islam has come for. And that's not what Islam is saying. You say the truth, but you look how you say it. Okay. You, you choose the wordings that you're gonna to use to, to preach to this person or to, to, to convey the message to this particular person. You choose it. You don't just say it the way you want and then look at you say, oh, the person doesn't wanna take the truth. I've been speaking to him for a long time. Yeah, but in a despicable way, you've been speaking to them. So the message should be conveyed, but it should be conveyed in a well-mannered way. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said uh, to Nabi Allah Musa Harun, idhaba ila Fir'aun innahu tagha. Go to Fir'aun, he's exceeded his limits. فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا Speak to him in a gentle manner. Why? لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرَ وَيَخْشَى The way that you speak to Fir'aun and the gentle message that you use for him will and could possibly it can humble him and it can maybe allow him to come to his senses. Allah knew that Fir'aun wasn't going to come back. But this is a lesson for you and I. وَلِذَلِكَ Some of the great scholars they used to say you are not better than Musa. He was commanded to speak in that way. Okay? And you, the person that you're talking to is not worse than Fir'aun. You're talking to a Muslim brother of yours. So I think that's balancing and not conflating the two that I just mentioned, which is conveying the message and also how you convey the message. Uh, the people, they should... Uh... Another thing I think before I, I, I stop is that in our podcast, we have more focus, we're more focused on um, what the people need and not what the people want. Okay. And that's, I think, what the job of a da'i is. He should focus on what the community need, what is important for them, and solving their problems and not what they want. Sometimes people want things that are bad for them, things that are detrimental for them. We need to focus on what the people want. And so what the people need. So I think inshallah ta'ala with that inshallah I hope I hope Allah brings khair and barakah out of this uh, I think you've laid down some really important fundamentals that inshallah we'll revisit later on throughout this episode but you spoke in detail about staying away from the people of innovation warning against the people of innovation but as you know we don't take certain ahadith and certain ayat from the Quran 
and we base our religion on that. We look at the religion as a whole. And there are other verses in the Qur'an and other ahadith that talk about, for example, husn al having good thoughts about your brother, not suspecting him, not backbiting him. Isn't what you're saying contradictory to all of this? This concept of al-hadharu min al-bid'i wal mubtadi'in, be cautious of innovation and to be cautious from the innovators, it's, it's not selected evidences here and there, to be frank and honest. Mm -hmm. It's actually the entirety of the Qur'an is warning against evil and its people and it's telling you to go towards good and its people. That's the whole entire Qur'an. Rather, the Qur'an is called Al-Furqan. Mm. Because what? يُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ الْحَقِّ وَالْبَاطِلِ The job of the Qur'an is to tell you this is right from this is wrong. وَلِذَلِكَ When Nabi Allah Muhammad came to Mecca and he called the people to Al-Islam, the accusation and that which was said about him was Muhammadun yufarriqu bayna al-nas ama Muhammadun farraqa bayna al-nas ama Muhammadun farqun bayna al-nas that Muhammad is dividing the people the reason why they said that is because he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was calling them to a, a message he didn't take he didn't water that message he didn't sallallahu alayhi wa sallam change it to fit into their society and etc what he did sallallahu wa sallam was he gave the message as it was let me mention some evidences. Maybe some people who are listening haven't even heard of these evidences. Our mother Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, Amma radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, may Allah be pleased with her and her father. She is the wife of the Prophet. Aisha was the wife of the Prophet. And we can say that she, was, she is the most knowledgeable woman that we know in Islam. Our mother Aisha. وَلِذَلِكَ الْإِمَامَ الزَّرْكَشِي He has a kitab called إِسْتَدْرَاكَاتَ Aisha عَلَى بَعْضِ الصَّحَابَةِ Aisha correcting some of the other companions. She is a scholar. Radiallahu ta'ala anha wa an abiha. She said that one day the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, this is found in Bukhari and Muslim, the two most authentic books. Okay. She said that the Prophet recited the famous ayah, huwa alladhi anzala alayka al-kitab minhu ayatu muhkamatun hunna umu al-kitab wa ukharu mutashabihat fa amma alladhina fi quloobim zaygun fa yattabi'una ma tashabaha minhu bitigha'a al-fitnati wa bitigha'a ta'wil. Aisha, the, she said that the Prophet recited this ayah. And when he recited this verse, she said, first of all, what does the verse mean, quickly? I mean, there's a lot of meaning in the verse that we can take uh, episodes on it. But the ayah, in summary, mentions that the Qur'an is divided into two. Ambiguous and vague verses, and verses which are clear-cut. Okay. Allah mentioned in that verse, people whose hearts are sick, whether they are non-Muslims, or whether they are Muslims. They won't go for the clear-cut verses. They will actually go towards the ambiguous verses, those vague verses, those verses that can take more than one interpretation. They're going to go for those ones. And they're going to make that the asal, the fundamental principle. And they're going to dismiss and push aside the clear-cut verses. Allah referred to them as sick-hearted individuals. They are sick-hearted people. I'll give you an example that can clarify that for you. For instance, Allah uses in the Quran, inna nahnu we. Yeah. Now we know the word we, even in English, it's used for one of two reasons. Either out of royalty, a person who, al-mu'addimu nafsahu, the person who's venerating himself out of royalty, or it can be used for al-mutakallim ma'ahu ghayru, a person who's talking and he's got somebody else talking with him, meaning plurality. Okay. It can be used for one of those two. A sick-hearted person will go towards huh? Yeah, the fact that it's more than one. They'll say that it's more than one. Because they don't want to go to the clear-cut verses that show Allah, when he uses the word nahn, we, he only means himself and he's speaking out of royalty. The ayat is, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ For instance, he doesn't want to go to that verse. So he's sick-hearted. Our messenger, when he recited that verse, he said to his wife, Aisha, he said to her, Aisha, if you see those people, they follow ma tashabaha minhu. Those ambiguous verses. Okay? They are the ones Allah has named. It's the ones Allah pointed out in this verse. Aisha is cautious of them. Be vigilant and diligent from these people. The Prophet Stay away from them. Said that. He said that to her. So the Quran, we know that there are verses which are unclear, that are ambiguous. The poet, Sahib uh, al-Maraqi, he said, He said, There are verses which we will never even know what its meaning are. 
Like for example, Alif Lam Mim and Huruf Muqatta'a, Saad and Qaf and letters like that. Allah kept the knowledge for Himself. And there are some verses which are unclear, but they become clear when you take them to what? When you take them back to the clear verses. Okay. It becomes clear. Sick hearted person, what would he do? He would not take all of these verses that we're going to mention. He's going to say, well, I want to take the one here and the one there. So our mother Aisha, the Prophet warned her from those type of people. He said, stay away from them. Now, question here is, Aisha has knowledge to determine who's saying what and what and the response to him. She knows that. But he still told her to stay away from them. In another ayah, Allah wa ta'ala, what did he say? This is my path, فَاتَّبِعُوهُ follow it. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُولَ And do not follow the path of the deviated people who went astray. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُولَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِ ذَلِكُمْ وَصَاكُمْ بِي لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Don't follow those people's paths. They will take you away from what pleases Allah Azza wa Jalla. They will throw you into the ditch. They will throw you into Hawiyah. Another ayah, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He said, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, He said, وَقَدْ نَزَلْ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الْكِتَابِ أَنْ إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ يُكْفَرُوا بِهَا وَيُسْتَهْزَأُوا بِهَا فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعَهُمْ حَتَّى يَخُوضُوا فِي حَدِيثٍ غَيْرِهِ إِنَّكُمْ إِذَا مِثْلُهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ جَامِعُ الْمُنَافِقِينَ وَالْكَافِرِينَ فِي جَهَنَّمَ جَمِيعًا Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He mentions in this ayah, He says, if you come across a people who are speaking about the verses of Allah with no knowledge, they are distorting the meaning of the Qur'an, they are misinterpreting the Qur'an, فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعَهُمْ Don't sit with these people, the innovators. The misguided people, don't sit with them. Leave them, get away from them. Allah mentions in that same verse, if you do sit with them, and you choose to still carry on being with them, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He clearly says, إِنَّكُمْ إِذَا مِثْلُهُمْ You are like them then. Now this ayah, some may say, oh, but this is what it means, and how do you know it's referring to the innovators and whatnot? Let me give you the statement of the scholars. Al-Imam Al-Qurtubi is one of the great, great, illustrious scholars of Islam, bona fide. And he has a tafsir book. Look what he said, rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, وَإِذَا ثَبَتَ تَجَنُّبُ أَهْلِ الْمَعَاصِي This is after he spoke about, you have to stay away from the sinners. If a person drinking alcohol, you can't sit in his gathering, and etc. I said, after I have established, Qurtubi saying this, after I have established to stay away from the in, in people of sins and the criminals, كَمَا مَرَّ As I just mentioned, فَتَجَنُّبُ To stay away from أَهْلُ الْبِدَعِ The people of innovation وَالْأَهْوَائِ And desires أَوْلَى is more befitting. If I'm telling you to stay away from the people drinking alcohol and committing zina, who are lying, who are cheating, then to stay away from the innovators, it's actually even more, more befitting. It's more befitting. Look what he then said. وَقَالَ عَامَّةُ الْمُفَسِّرِينَ The overwhelming majority of the Mufassirin have said, هي محكمة this eye is clear. وروى جبي جبيبر عن الضحاك قال دخل في هذه الآية the people who enter into this verse are كل محدث every innovator في الدين who innovated in this religion إلى قيا إلى يوم القيامة until the day of judgment. That's one ayah. Another ayah Allah تبارك وتعالى he says وإذا رأيت الذين خوضون في آياتنا فأعرض عنهم حتى يخوضوا في حديث غيره. وَإِمَّا يُنْسِيَنَّكَ الشَّيْطَانُ فَلَا تَقْعُدْ بَعْدَ ذِكْرَ مَعَلْقُمِ الظَّالِمِينَ I want to mention to you a powerful, extremely powerful statement of Imam al-Shawkani. I actually believe this statement is enough for us to conclude the whole podcast. Okay. It's that powerful, subhanAllah. Look what Shawkani says. I was really amazed how he spoke about this topic. He said, وَفِي هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ In this verse, he said there's a mo'idah, there's a lesson, a reminder. عَظِيمَةٌ A great reminder. لِمَنْ يَتَسَمَّحُ بِمُجَالَسَةِ الْمُبْتَدَعَةِ Those who permit, those who sit with the innovators. Which innovators? الَّذِينَ يُحَرِّفُونَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ Those who are distorting the speech of Allah. Okay, every innovator, you will see that he distorts the Qur'an. Whether it be distorting it physically by changing it, and inshallah that won't happen because Allah will protect it. And the second type of distortion which is to change its meanings. To change the meaning, and also that inshallah won't happen because there's always hurras, people are going to protect the religion. So, this verse, he said, there's a great reminder for those who sit and permit and like to sit with the innovators. Which innovators? Those who distort the speech of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And they are playing around with the book of Allah. And the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they bring everything back to their desires. When you say something to them, they say, mm, I'm not inclined to it, I don't like it. 
which desires ila ahwaihimul mudilla their misguided designs wa bid'ahimul fasida and their corrupt innovation fa innahu idha lam yunkir alayhim if the person does not reject these people if the person does not debunk these people and dismantle their belief wa yughayyir ma'hum and he doesn't change their affairs fi then fa aqallu al ahwal let the basic thing that you at least do let the thing that you at least do be and yet that you leave off sitting with them at least you couldn't change them you saw that these people are persistent upon their misguidance and they are persistent upon uh, going against Allah's commandments falling into the, their, 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 whims, their whims and their desires then let the least that you can do be to walk away from them and not to sit with them look what he then said that's very easy and it's not hard I like this statement I love this he said, وَقَدْ يَجْعَلُونَ They would take your sitting with them. حُضُورَهُ مَعَهُمْ مَعَ تَنَزُّهِ عَمَّا يَتَلَبَّسُونَ بِي شُبْهَةً يُشَبِّهُونَ بِهَا عَلَى الْعَامَةً You sitting with them. You being with them. They will say to the people, we are upon guidance. Subhanallah. Imam so-and-so is with us. Sheikh so-and-so, Ustad so-and-so is with us. So how can we be misguided? So-and-so who calls to the Sunnah, who's been preaching the Sunnah, who fights for the Sunnah, who holds them to the Sunnah, is with us. How can we be misguided? How can we be astray? That's what they would say. فَيَكُونُوا فِي حُضُورِهِ مَثَّدَةٌ Him participating, him being there with them, him cutting the cake with them, and all of that. There's going to be in there مَثَّدَةٌ زَائِدَةٌ It's actually an additional problem. What's the additional problem? Because you couldn't change their evil. That was already a problem. You sitting with them, it was, another, it was another problem. And now you've added more onto it. Which is that you have made the eyes of the general mass turn towards this person. Because your affiliation with somebody makes the people think that this person is verified. This person is, mashallah, he is up there. You see, في حضوره مفسدة زائدة على مجرد سماع المنكر You sitting with them is a greater evil than just listening to the evil. Another evidence that I want to mention, inshallah ta'ala, is the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The messenger said, in that, this is mentioned by a Muslim in his muqaddimah, and it's important that people understand this. If you quote a hadith that's in the introduction of Muslim, you can't just say Muslim narrated and leave it like that. Okay. You have to clearly say that it is in the introduction of Muslim, in the muqaddimah of Muslim. The reason is because they say that the muqaddimah doesn't have the same condition of what is in his, in, in his, in, in his main book. So we have to say that because there can be weak narrations in the Muqaddimah. Okay. But this is authentic. Muslim narrated this in his Muqaddimah. And Abu Huraira said that the Prophet said, سيكون في آخر أمتي Before the hour strikes, آخر الزمان The ending of the hour, there's going to be أناس يحدثونكم There's going to come in people. They will talk to you guys. They will preach. They will convey the so-called message of Islam to you. مَا لَمْ تَسْمَعُوا أَنْتُمْ وَلَا آبَاؤُكُمْ And they will say things that you've never heard of and your forefathers have never heard of it. فَإِيَّاكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ Stay away from them. Stay away from them. Be cautious of them. Who's saying this? The Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. Nabiullah Muhammad is saying this. Stay away from them. Be cautious. And I want to say to the people who are listening to the podcast, I want to say, after those evidence that I gave, no one should argue against Allah and His Messenger. Allah said in the Quran, مَا يُجَادِلُ فِي آيَاتِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا The only people who argue against the verses of Allah are the disbelievers. How did Allah say that? Where did he? Well, no, no, I don't, I don't understand that. That's dividing the people. مَا يُجَادِلُ فِي آيَاتِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَلَا يَغْرُرْكَ تَقَلُّبُهُمْ فِي الْبِلَادِ The people who argue against it are people who have desires and who have illness. And maybe that person should be worried for himself and concerned for himself that he would question such evidences. Okay. This is where I'm at. I, I think you provided sufficient proof for staying away from innovators, warning can I, against can innovators. I, can I, I know I, you, I, I should Go on. Be, can I give examples of the Prophet doing it himself? Warning against? People, individuals, saying their names. You have examples? I have examples. Okay. Fatima bint Qais was a woman who came to the Prophet sallallahu She said, Ya Rasulullah, annaha dhakkarat lil Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She mentioned to the Prophet, and the Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. She said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Now, we want to understand who Muawiyah is. Muawiyah is the Katib al Wahi. He's the writer. He is the uh, scriber who writes the revelation. 
That's what he's stated. He's been trusted with the revelation of the Quran. Like he's a reliable person. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Noble companion. Muawiyah. Aba Jahmin is another noble companion. Both of these companions, they came for the hand of Fatima bin Tiqay. So Fatima came to the Prophet. She wants to consult him. She said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, two men have come for me and they want to get married to me. What do you think? The Prophet said to her, Amma Abu Jahmin. As for Abu Jahmin, Abu Jahmin. He doesn't take the, his sword, uh, sorry, his, 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 his uh, stick. He doesn't throw his stick from his shoulder. Meaning he's always carrying his stick. In another narration, the Prophet said, He beats the women. That's what he does. In other words, don't marry him. The second companion, the, noble, the second noble companion is Muawiyah. And then he said, وَأَمَّا مُعَاوِيَةً فَسُعْلُوكُ لَا مَا لَهُ Muawiyah doesn't have wealth. So don't go for him. Then he said, أَنْكِحِ أُسَامَةً بْنِ زَيْدٍ Go and marry Usama ibn Zayd. Now Usama is the person who the Prophet instructed her to get married to. And he told her to stay away from two noble companions. Let's focus here. The Prophet is warning a woman, a female companion, about the marriage of two noble companions. The messenger, first of all, did not mention the good in these two companions. He didn't. He straight away went into the what? That which he faults them on. I mean, that which he felt was necessary to tell, to tell Fatima bin Tiqais. Number two, the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he saw it binding to speak about them. And this was not considered to be backbiting. He spoke about them. Yeah, no one would say the Prophet back, fell into backbiting or sort of done. At all. He mentioned a reality in front of them. If you go to Riyadh al-Salihin, Riyadh al-Salihin, everyone knows that book, right? Yeah. It's a loved book, right? Yeah. No, we chapter, a chapter where he called it Babu ma yubahu min al-ghiba. The times when backbiting is permissible. And from them, do we find this? In of that course he does. Six times he said it's permissible. Six different situations he said it. From them is, from them is if you see a person who's walking to a teacher, wanting to take knowledge from him, and that teacher is corrupt, then he said it is permissible to backbite him and to say that, stay away from this teacher, don't go to him. Now, what are we saying this? That's exactly what we're talking about now. Exactly what he said. Another example I want to show you is that Aisha, she said, A man sought permission to enter upon the Prophet Sallallahu When the Prophet saw the man, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? Oh, he heard him. He said, Bitsa akhul ashira. Evil is this, is this man. Evil is, is this man. Now, now were we commenting on this statement, this hadith in, uh, in his uh, Sahih Muslim, he explained it. He said, this is an indication and an evidence that if an evil person comes and you believe that it's going to harm the people that you speak against him. And another time we know the famous hadith when the Prophet said about a companion. He said, Kadaba Abu Sanabil. Abu Sanabil was a companion. He gave a verdict in an issue and he got it wrong. The Prophet said, Abu Sanabil lied. He lied. Walidarika Al Imam Ahmed, a man came to him and he said to him, It's hard on me. A man came to Al Imam Ahmed and he said to him, It's actually hard on me to speak about the people. I can't speak about people. I can't do that. Okay. I cannot do that. I can't say fulan and kada, wa fulan and kada, so and so is this, and so and so is that. I, I can't do that. فقال أحمد, and Imam Ahmed said to him, إذا سكت أنت, if you become quiet, وسكت أنا, and I then become quiet as well. فمتى يعرف الجاهل? When will the ignorant one know الصحيح من السقيم, who is right and who is, who is a fraudster? star? How are the people going to know? Yeah. If I go quiet and you go quiet and everyone goes quiet, then no one will know who is real and who is fake. No one will know. Lahi, you've convinced me. You've convinced me. But there is still a few issues outstanding. And that first of them is we, our discussion so far has been about innovators. And it's easy to warn against a clear-cut innovator who you know is opposing the sunnah. But the question is, as is the case with many, many speakers out there who are giving da'wah, what if, you're not, what if they haven't made clear what they're upon? And you're not 100% sure if they're an innovator. From them people, I'm assuming it's okay to take knowledge? I do want to say something which is important. That is, إِخْرَاجُ النَّاسِ عَلِ السُنَّةِ شَدِيرٌ As Imam Ahmed said, taking the people out of the sunnah is something very hard. Okay. It's not an easy matter. A 
person shouldn't be hasty and jump on it. Especially if you have no knowledge. That's not your field to speak about it. But what I do want to say is, warning against a person who is an innovator, and it's clear to you that he's an innovator, and I'll mention how you can know it's clear to you and what makes it clear. I will speak about that. I will not push that aside. We should warn against that person. And it's upon the, it's an amana, it's a responsibility on, on that da'i and on that talib ilm to warn the people against that person and say, don't take that knowledge from that person. And this issue is not a disputed issue, by the way. It's a consensus. I'm saying that no two scholars from the pious predecessors differed on that. Let me mention one consensus for this issue. Tabit ibn Ajlanin, he said, Adraktu Anas ibn Malikin, wa ibn al-Musayyibi, wa al-Hasan al-Basriya, wa Sa'id ibn Jubayrin, wa al-Shaabi, wa Ibrahim al-Nakha'iya, wa Ata ibn Abi Rabahin, wa Tawusin, wa Mujahidin, wa Abdullah ibn Abi Mulaykat, wa Zuhri, wa Makhulin, wa Al-Qasim aba Abdul Rahman, wa Ata al-Khurasani, wa Tabit al-Bunaniya, wa Al-Hakam ibn Uneynat, wa Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, wa Hamadan, wa Muhammad ibn Sirin, wa Aba Amirin, wa Kana qad adraka Aba Bakr ibn Siddiq. Aba Amir him Abu Bakr Siddiq, wa Yazid al-Raqashi, wa Sulaiman ibn Musa, kulluhum, all of those I mentioned. يأمروني بالجماعة. They told me stick with the Jama'a, أهل السنة. وينهوني and they prohibited me from and they warned me from what عن أصحاب الأهواء, the people of desires. اجمع. Okay. This is a مسألة أجمعت فيه السلف. The Salaf they unanimously agreed upon. And it's worrying that after that a person will still question and say, really? Why? What are you guys talking about? Abdullah ibn Abbas and he said, La tujalis ahl al ahwa. Don't sit with the people of innovation. For in mujalasatun, sitting with the people of innovation, mumridatun lil qulub. It is what? It, it brings illness to the heart. Some people they say, Tazkiyatun nafs. We want to purify our hearts. Yes, we need to purify our hearts. But one of the things that taint the heart is to sit with the innovators, to take from them, yeah. to be with them. It makes the heart sick. And it destroys your heart. And it's what brings darkness to your heart and dots to your heart. And makes your life hard. So stay away from the innovators. Now, people who fall into mistakes or people who come with shortcomings yeah. and they're in the da'wah scene, we have to understand that what type of mistake have they fallen into. This is something very important that's understood. Because I think you're going to explain the, the question here is if you're saying stay away from innovators, how does one know who has fallen into innovation? Okay. Let me mention what makes a person from the Sunnah. Al Imam al Safarini is Al Awamir al Anwar. He says something very powerful. He said, He's talking about the people of the Sunnah. Ahl Sunnah, who are they? Okay. They are ones who take, they take their belief. That which is transmitted from Allah. So you want to recognize who's right and who's wrong. Okay. Okay? They take their religion, their belief system. Okay? They take it from what? Anillahi from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Fi kitabi, that which he mentioned in his book, the Quran. O fi sunnati nabi, or that which the messenger mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or that which has been transmitted from the Prophet. O ma tabata wa sahha an is salaf is salih. And that which has authentically been transmitted from the pious predecessors. Who? Mena sahabati al kiram wa tabi'een al fikhar. That sahabas were the students of the Prophet and the students of the companions. So here, stop. A person will say to you, I take the Quran yeah. and I take the Sunnah. Yeah. The mafraq al-turuq, the thing that will really allow you to know that if this person is real or if he's telling the truth is when you say to them, this verse that you have used for this point, who from the Sahabas understood it in this way? Who from the early generation who the Prophet praised? Because look what the Prophet said. The Prophet said something very powerful. Look what he said. He said, my ummah is going to be divided. 72 sects. Uh, 73 sects, sorry. 73 groups. The Ummah, ستفترقوا أمتي على 73 فرقة. 73 groups. كلها في النار. All of them are in the hellfire. إلا واحدة, except one. Not two, not three, not four. This goes against those who say, those who say that everyone's going to go to Jannah from different places. Yeah. This group, and that group, and this group, and this group, we're all going to meet, inshallah ta'ala, from different parts of Jannah. لا. When it comes to belief system, there's only one saved group. There's not multiple groups. Illa wahida, the Prophet spoke. The most eloquent man, he said wahida, he didn't say two, he said one group. Who are they now? The Sahabas, he said, who are these people? He didn't say it is so and so, so and so, and so and so. 
the messenger gave what is called a sifatul kashifa. He gave a continuous description. Anyone who comes with is from that saved group. You don't have to, you don't have to sign an, an allegiance to a particular imam or a sheikh or you don't have to meet a person and shake his hand or none of that, none of that. You don't have to have a bond with a group of people. No, you don't have to. This is all that's needed from you. What is it? Man kana ala mithli ma ala alihi liyawma wa ashabi. Anyone who is upon that which me and my companions are upon now. So if you've told me a verse and you really can't take that verse back to an interpretation of a companion, then I'm worried about you. You're scaring me. You're coming with a newly introduced belief now. Because I was told that the saved group is the ones who are what? Who are upon that which a prophet was upon and that which his companions were upon. So if a person is holding on to the view of the companions, even if that view is weak, but the Sahaba said it, we will respect you because you're holding on to the statements of the companions. Okay. And all it now then takes is, it's an ijtihadi related issue. It's an ijtihadun sa'ikh. It's a permitted difference of opinion because you've got a group of companions. Even though they will still say we don't agree with that view of Ibn Abbas or that view of so-and-so because of another Sahabi statement, but we will not take you out of the fold of Ahl Sunnah. Or you will not be taken out of the fold of Ahl Sunnah because you're holding on to a view of Sahabas. Now I want to say something. If a person takes the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the consensus, pay attention, he takes the Mastar Talaqi. Mastar Talaqi means the source in which you take your religion from. Okay. We Ahl Sunnah, I hope we're from them, inshaAllah ta'ala, we take our religion from the Qur'an, and we take it from the Sunnah, and we take it from the consensus of the early generation. Okay, and I say early generation because it's hard to affirm consensus, hard, it's hard to confirm it after the Sahabas. It's hard. Okay. Not that it can't be done, but it's hard. And I'll bring the statement of Shaykh al Sam Taymiyyah, inshallah ta'ala. If anybody doesn't take those evidences, doesn't take the Quran or the Sunnah or the consensus, then he is an innovator and a proof is not established against him. The proof is not established against him. This is the statement of Abu Qasim, Hibatullah al and Imam Abu Uthman al sabuni uh, Imma said this. Shaykh al-Islam mentioned this. If a person says, I'm not going to take the Quran as an evidence, or I'm not going to take this sunnah, or he uses his logic, that person is an innovator. That minute he said it. Mm -hmm. There's and no need to bring the proof to against no, 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 him. Nobody has He's to already do. done it himself. No one's going to, everyone's going to deal with him as an innovator. Okay. Proof is not established on him. Okay? But if a person goes against Ahl sunnah in an asl min usuliha, a fundamental principle. Mm -hmm. Like for example, he goes against Ahl sunnah in a mas'alatul iman. Okay, he takes maybe the view of the murji'a or the view of the khawarij, then tuqamu alayhi hujjah The proof is established on him. So the, there's fundamental points that I want to mention that Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah believe that if a person goes against those fundamental, the proofs are established on him. Okay. Okay, if he, if he goes against the masdaru talaqi, the source of where we take our evidence from, no, 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 no. Uh, you're an innovator straight away. And a proof is not established on you. But if you go against Ahl Sunnah in the fundamental issues that are in there, you're going to, the proof is going to be established on you. You're going to be told what you're upon is wrong. You're going to be advised accordingly. And those usul, I'm going to mention them fast and we can go over them uh, inshallah ta'ala uh, later. The first one is uh, al asma wa sifat Allah's names and attributes. Number two, As-Sahaba, companions, and the position of the companions. Al-Qadha wa al-Qadr, the predestination and the, the, what Allah has ordained for creation. Number three, Masail al-Asma'i wal-Ahkam, names and rulings that are found in the Quran, like Iman and Kufr and etc. And last but not least, Al-Wa'd wal waid the warnings and the promises in the Quran and how do we deal with them. These are five usul that you find in books of Al-Tiqad. If anybody gets, goes against Ahl sunnah in those five, proof is established against them. If he persists upon them, then he's an innovator, and the dealing of the innovators will come into place. Okay. These five, Sheikh Al-Islam talks about them in Aqidatul Wasistiyah. He summarized them all. A person studies it there. Also, Abu Bakr Ismaili in his kitab, Al-Itiqadi Aymat Al-Hadith, he mentions it there. Aqidatul Salaf, Ashab Al-Hadith, Abu Uthman Al-Sabuni mentions it there as well. Abu Qasim Al-Taymi mentions in his kitab, Al-Hujjah Fi Bayani Al-Mahajjah. Abu Qasim Al-Taymi mentions it. Uh, Abu Qasim Hibatullah Al Alakai sorry mentions it in his kitab Usul Atiqad Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah. It's in the books of Aqidah. Okay. 
the th- th- second thing that I want to mention, the, the third thing I want to mention is if a person comes with so many sub branches. For example, he says, a man can shave his beard. Okay, that's a fiqh issue. It's a fara. It's not even a fundamental issue. It's a sub branch. Okay, even though that's a question because it is a consensus, by the way. Mm. Maybe that example might not be correct. Mm-hmm. But let's say he says, for example, anal sex is permissible. And then he says, for example, you can drink with your right, uh, left. And then he says, for example, music is halal. And then he says, uh, um, many fiqh issues, he brings them and he says, permissible, 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 permissible. These are for all sub-branches. They are what? They are sub-branches. These for all now make it advice. You get established rules, proof are going to be established upon you. If you persist, you're an innovator. Okay. That is what the scholars mention. Well, in you find two groups of people, they are extreme either in exaggeration or extreme in negligence. Who are they? There's a group who say everything you need to establish the proof against the person, you need to take the pr-. And another group of people, no, 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 I don't establish proof on anybody. Mm-hmm. He said a mistake, he's off the, he's off the manhaj. Right, right, yeah, so as I mentioned, is what the Salaf said. I can put all their speech in context, but it's better just to give the framework, inshallah ta'ala. Mustafa, right now you've given a lot of detail on why we should leave alone even innovators and not even sit with them, as you said. But my question is, what if you have an individual, like there are many, many individuals in the world today who are not openly calling to innovation. Mm-hmm. Do we treat them the same as the other innovators that you're speaking about? Without a doubt, if you look at the books of the Sunnah, the, you look at the books of the scholars, um, books of Hadith as well, the scholars, they do distinguish between the one who calls to his innovation and the one who doesn't. Okay. If a person is not calling to his innovation, he takes a total different ruling from the one who isn't calling to it. So if he's calling and if he isn't calling, it's two different rulings. So would you not agree that many of the speakers today are not calling to their innovation? They're rather calling to doing good deeds, like reading the Quran, being good to your parents. Mm. Is that something you'd agree with? You see, that's the thing. Uh, I mean, I, 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 when, I say, when, when I say a lot of the speakers, then I, that would mean I would have to look at statistics and I would have to, I don't know, I can't say all of them or majority of them. Or, but what I can say is there are a portion of them I can definitely say that calling to misguidance is it's not a person has to come and say um, I'm the jal or I am here to misguide you. It's done in different ways and different forms. I mean, let me just read a speech on you, which I think is very uh, relevant to the question that you just okay. asked. Yeah, this statement of Imam uh, Sheikh Al Sam Taymiyyah okay. that they are away from what was what's really you know important for for them to understand. Sheikh Al Sam Taymiyyah he says, The innovation at the beginning is just a handspan. Okay. Okay. And the followers, that handspan innovation becomes an arm span. Mm-hmm. And then it becomes a mile. And then it becomes, you know, continents. It just grows, the, the innovation. So it's not like it's, you're going to see a big innovation straight away. It, it creeps in. Another statement, Mufadal ibn Muhalhalin said, لو كان صاحب البدعة, If the innovator that the person is taking knowledge from, yeah. If you sat with him, if I sat with him, he will tell you if you sat with him and as soon as you sat with him, he told you his innovation, you know, you would run away from him and you would not want to sit with him. He will tell you the hadith of the sunnah. At the beginning of... The gathering, the first times that you meet him, he will call you to the sunnah. He, this is what he will do to you. Then he will put the innovation into you. And then it connects to your heart. And then when it would actually leave your heart? Okay, but what I can see from my personal experience is many of the people giving da'wah, they might not necessarily be clear-cut innovators like you're saying. But at the same time, you might not even put them into the category of clearly, as you mentioned, understanding the Qur'an and the Sunnah based upon the understanding of the companions. Rather, it's unclear exactly where they fall in between those two groups. Those kind of people, they're still calling you to good deeds. You can listen to them. Okay, that's again, a very important thing, which is we would have to really ask ourselves, what makes a person be a person who's doing, doing good and what isn't, who isn't really doing good? Okay. Um, like I would say my question would be, what, your message, who is it following? What protocol is it following? What, what uh, order and sequence is it following? Mm. 
Yeah. Are you making the order for the da'wah? Are you you're just making it as you wish? Because for me, da'wah is tawqifiyah. I mean, it's, it's something that's set. You and I can't come and make our way in da'wah. Okay, but when you say for you, that means someone else can have a different opinion. No, I'm saying when the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam وَأَنَّ هَذَا سَرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوا This is my path, follow it. Okay, there's certain things we'd agree are good deeds. Reading the Quran is a good deed. We'd agree on that. I, I, and I'm saying that that person should call to the Quran. Okay. He should call to righteous actions as in plain sunnah. He should call to that. But that shouldn't be the, um, the essence of his da'wah. Okay, the essence of his da'wah should be then? Calling to Tawheed and calling to the people to stay away from innovation. That's what La ilaha Allah stands on. And Imam Muslim narrated this in his Sahih in the Riwayat Anas ibn Malikin okay. that the Prophet said, La taqumu sa'a. The hour will not strike. Hatta la yuqalu fil ardi. Until no one is saying on the earth, Allah, Allah. Subhanallah. That will come a time when people are not even saying Allah, Allah. Meaning it's become total ignorance of who Allah is and the meaning of Allah and the meaning of La ilaha Allah. People won't even say Allah anymore. And you know why that will come about? It will, be, it will come about when people start becoming generic in their da'wah. They don't really want to touch the real problems that the community are facing. So let's just be more general. That, to be very honest, some speakers, if you actually take their da'wah and you replace the word Allah with God, mm. then a Christian can listen to him. Okay, you, would you agree that there are some du'as out in the world today that are calling to Tawheed? No doubt. No doubt about that. Yes. So what is wrong with having one speciality calling to Tawheed mm. and someone else calling to generic good deeds? What is the problem with that? As I just said, da'wah is not something that you and I choose what we want to start with and how we want to do it. Da'wah is set. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the ayah, what he say? قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ This ayah says, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي This is my path. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ I call to Allah. عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ with insight. I call to Allah and who, was, who else does the same thing? Those who follow me. So the people have to follow the messenger in how they call to Allah. That's clear in the ayah. Okay, the ayah so okay. you and I, not, we don't have the rights to come and say, you know, I, I don't want to call to Tawheed. It's a controversial issue. I'm here to bring people together, you know, and I'm going to look for topics that can bridge people. That's a fallacy. That's a mistaken belief. Even in the modern world where we have so many different groups opposing Islam, so many enemies of Islam, so many issues, can't we just come together and work together on that and leave our differences to a side? Consider we've got big, big problems that we're Ummah facing. That is not the truth when you look at it. Because if you look at the great scholars like Ibn al-Jawzi, Rahimahullah, Abdul Ghani, Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, they said that the internal enemy, meaning the innovator, is far worse than the external enemy that's outside. I'll give you an example. If you're under siege, and you have a fortress around you, but there is a person in this building right now who wants to open the window for the disbelievers or the non-Muslims or other people to enter the house. You have to start dealing with this person inside first. Okay. So when you try ignoring this person, you say, you know, we will work together on what we agree on and we will put our differences aside on what we differ on. Then the truth really is, the minute he gets, he will, he will expose the mistakes within Islam and ponder on history. History repeats itself. That's a reality. What destroyed the Abbasi Khilafah? It was the Rafidah who opened the doors for the non-Muslims. Who brought the Tatar into the Muslim world and made the Muslims get killed and massacred? They were the innovators. Who placed Shaykh al-Islam, Imam Ahl al-Sunnati wal-Jama'ah, Imam al-Mubajjal, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahimahullah in prison, behind bars of the issue of Khalq al-Quran? Who Ibn Hazm has a kitab called Al Milal. Uh, uh, he has a kitab called Al Fisal fil Milal wal Ahwa wal Nihal. He mentions in this book the people who push the ideology that the Quran is not preserved was the, was the Rafida. Ibn Hazm is saying this when they said that the Quran was changed by Abu Bakr and Umar, it allowed the non-Muslims to say that your text is not preserved. Why are you talking about ours? Even though Allah says in the Quran, cooperate with each other upon birr and taqwa. You see, how do you reconcile that? That's the, now this is very important that's understood correctly. First of all, we have to agree that we as individuals, we do not like innovation, nor do we like innovators. Okay, agreed. I'm with you on that. If we agree upon that, if there happens a situation, a calamity befalls the Muslim, yeah. and I have been known and I have had a position regarding debunking, dismantling, calling against innovation, I have been known, my position is well known when it comes to uh, people who go against Allah's commandments, who fall into sins, it's well known. I have defended the Sunnah to my ability. 
if a calamity befalls the Muslims. And there's no way that this calamity can be solved unless the Muslims with their differences come together to solve this issue. Shar'an is permissible. There's nothing wrong with this. Okay. Right this moment. With, but that doesn't mean we overlook our, each, our differences. No, not in any way, shape or form. I still have differences with you and I'm not going to accept that from you. But right now, they're going to close the masjids. Hmm. And that's a problem you're going to face and I'm going to face. Yeah. And we take this evidence from Sunul yeah. Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Yeah. The Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, he sat with the non-Muslims and he came to a contract with them and a treaty with them. Ibn al-Qayyim in his great book, he said, he mentions that this can be used for the innovators hmm. and the fusaq, the criminals and the wrongdoers and even the innovators. He uses that. To say that you can sit with them if it has a common good for the Muslims. But that being said, your position, your view, your stance, it is well known okay. regarding innovators. Your position is known regarding innovation itself. You've spent your time spreading the sunnah. And to be very frank with you, and to be honest, a lot of people, they don't understand that calling to that in sunnah right now and pushing the sunnah today it's become very hard. It's always going to be hard, but it's become even more harder today than any other time historically. Wow. Let me quote for you the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, what he said. And I want to bring you the kalam of the ulama and how they understood, how they understood that particular, how they understood that particular hadith. Look what he said, Imam Sabuniyu. He said, Anyone who holds on to the Sunnah now, he's an Imam of the early generation. Imam Imam Sunnah. Okay. He's talking about his, his, his time. time. Imagine now. He said, وَمَنْ تَمَسَّكَ الْيَوْمَ بِسُنَّتِ Anyone who holds on to the sunnah today. Which sunnah? بِسُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَعَمِلَ بِهَا أَنِ إِمْبْلَمَنْتِ وَاسْتَقَامَ عَلَيْهَا أَنِ اسْتَدْفَاسْتَ upon it. وَدَعَا إِلَيْهَا أَنِ calls the people to it. كَانَ أَجْرُهُ His reward today is أَوْفَرَ وَأَكْثَرَ More vast. More bigger, more greater. من أجر من جرى على هذه الجملة من الاعتقاد في أوائل الإسلام والملة. Then the early generation, then the companions themselves as well. Why? إذ الرسول المصطفى because the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم قال he said له for those people is أجر خمسين the reward of fifty. فقيل the companions they said خمسين منهم fifty from them and the prophet said لا no من كم from you. 50 from the companions. We know that today, the ghurbah, the, the person calling to the sunnah, yeah. the standing up to the sunnah, implementing the sunnah, has become very hard. Look at Imam Sabuni. Is Sabuni. that really the case, Ustad? Without a shadow of a doubt. In, in the modern day world, you think that calling to the sunnah is a difficult, difficult yeah, thing? Yeah, mocking, name calling. No, that, that's. مِمَّا لَا يَنْتَضْحُ فِيهِ كَبْشَانَ As the Arabs say, two goats will not headbutt on that. That's a reality in front of us. Another statement I'm going to mention, inshallah ta'ala, and I think it's important. Abu Uthman al-Sabuni mentions, بِسَنَدِي وَجَادَةً حَتَّى بَلَغَ بِنُ شِهَابِ الزُّهْرِي From Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. That he said, تَعْلِيمُ سُنَّةٍ Teaching one sunnah. أَفْضَلُ is more virtuous. مِنْ عِبَادَةِ مِئَتَيْ سَنَةٍ Than doing ibadah for 200 years. And this is the truth, wallahi, when you look at many people. People are now more fascinated with a person who pray qiyamul layl. A person who fast the fast of Dawood, and I'm not belittling that. I think it's a righteous action, and I think a Muslim should work to be doing that. I, I'm not belittling that. But what I'm saying is that people will be mesmerized with that person. They would be mind boggled. They would be gobsmacked and say, wow, this person's righteous. He's a remaining of the companions, mm. the way they deal with him. But if a person stood up and he spent his life and dedicated his energy to warning against innovation, exposing innovators, for them it's like, yeah. All he does is he backbites people. Mm. All he does is he backbites people. And that isn't the case. To call to the sunnah and to wolf an innovation was the that was salaf, was the doing of the salaf and their way. And the thing is, how would we deal with these texts? Are we going to rub them off the books? No. We're going to peel them out? This is, the, this is the reality. You cannot ignore this. These are multitude. I am only taking a pinch of it. Because we only I have. Mean, a... I think we agree with the, the issue of innovation, and I think you brought enough evidence and sufficient amount of evidence to prove your point there. The issue still remains, and I go back to it again, that you're sitting here saying that someone who is calling people to do good deeds, as well as tawheed, but tawheed is not their main da'wah, but they're still calling people to read the Quran, be good to their parents. Okay, you know, you're, you're repeating this point. Let me, yeah. make, let me give you some examples. This point you keep stressing on. Because you're saying they're actually doing something wrong and okay. bad. Okay, let me give you a story. 
the story inshallah ta'ala will shine some light for you okay. okay again as i said i'm going to be in the Karim. every single thing i bring i'm going to bring stories i'm going to, from the books of hadith okay. from the tarajim of the scholars the biography of the scholars and quotes of people who we and i cannot we're not like even the nails and before i mention these quotes i want to say something i want to say don't judge and memorize this principle and know nothing can we can never make a judgment based on something based on the outcome and the results that somebody produces we need to look at your principles that you stand on and what are you what's your message if you're doing humanitarian aid and you're supporting the needy that's good that is good but bill gates does that as well warren buffett does that as well that doesn't that doesn't make their message right does that make sense yeah. missionaries they do that as well they go to africa and they feed the needies they build wells but they're not calling to the quran exactly that doesn't make these these people are so let me let me okay. i'm going to show you examples because those are disbelievers now i'm going to show you people are believers Fadda. and imam Dhabi mentioned he said can al-mansur abi ja'far al-mansur is a abbasi leader okay he used to venerate yu'addim ibn ubaidin he used to venerate amr ibn ubaid who's amr ibn ubaid amr ibn ubaidin is the leader the head, the head, him and Wasim and Ata, they were the head of the deviated group referred to as the Mu'tazila. Okay. The Mu'tazila are the people who are clearly who... innovators. We again to remind you, we're talking about people who are not open about the innovation. We don't know whether they're clearly innovators. They're halfway in between. We're not clear about mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. That's who we're talking about. I'm going to come to that point. That's okay. a very good point. I, I I see where you come. It's a good point. Like in Mansour Abu Jafar al Mansour, he said, you know, uh, they'd be saying. The leader of the Muslims got fooled with Amr ibn Ubaidin. Just like you're seeing this person mm-hmm. that you're talking about to be a person of, you know, good. Well, what's the yes. problem? He's going into good. Yeah. Abi Ja'far al-Mansur felt the same thing about Amr ibn Ubaid. This leader from the, the head of the Mu'tazila. He saw nothing wrong with him. Look what he did. Amr ibn Ubaidin entered onto uh, the leader of Abi Ja'far al-Mansur. They had a conversation. And when he was about to leave, Abi Ja'far al-Mansur said, I'm going to give you something. Here, what money do you need? Give money to him. And he looked and he said, I haven't come here for money and I don't want your money. And he walked away from him. Mm-hmm. And it's a more detailed story, but I don't want to go into okay, it. Well. As he was walking away, Abi Ja'far al-Mansur, he said, okay. All of them have an ulterior motive. All of them have something they want. Look what he said. But Amr ibn Ubaid is a real man. He's a real righteous man. What's wrong with him? That's what he's trying to say. Mm-hmm. Look what Dhabi said. He said, He got deceived by the aestheticism of Amr ibn Ubaid. He saw Amr ibn Ubaid to be a person who doesn't want the dunya, wants the akhirah. And so he thought to himself, Wow, this guy's good. Hmm. He got deceived by the sincerity of Amr ibn Ubaid. And he was heedless to his innovation. Okay. So many people are looking at this man in the good things that he sees and he says, But there's innovation here right now. Yeah. Another, another story I, I th- that's not that's not answer my question you understand that right it does answer the question because this person's calling to salah and calling to zakat and yes. calling to psalm and calling yes. to the recitation with no them. clear innovation upon them no clear innovation they just haven't made it clear that they're upon the sunnah yeah and they're not calling to tawheed as much as you'd like them to they're calling to tawheed but it, but they're not as much as you'd like them to but they're still calling to good deeds it's How a person's call- i mean when we say when we say okay a person's calling to tawheed I'm, I, I i myself am not saying that you know ha- how many times how many videos have he said has he said it into okay it's not the main call it's not the main call dawah then i'm now saying that he's not following the procedure and the sequence set by the prophet okay now i can question him because the da'wah of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam was built upon tawheed that was what he was built on i mean nabi Nuh, let's take nabi Nuh for an example yeah. no alayhi salam what do you know about his message he was calling people for 950 years up only to worship Allah alone who how much people followed Nabi Nuh Allah said mm-hmm. only little believed in Nabi Nuh he didn't care about numbers the people who followed Nuh was amount that can go on an ark yeah. with animals in there mm-hmm. he was a man that can go on an ark with animals in there you know animals were in there as well he that Nabi Nuh we know his message was built upon a tawheed you don't know anything more than that about him so how can I see a da'i and I don't see any of that. All I see is talking about political engagement. Yeah, okay. He's talking, he's an activist. He's talking about um, 
social problems only only fair point okay i understand no, that's a fair point but even like you just mentioned numbers just now some of these speakers mm -hmm. who like you're saying don't necessarily focus on tawheed mm -hmm. but they're still calling to good deeds mm -hmm. Some of them have millions and millions of views on their videos and millions and millions of followers on social media. So you're sitting here and saying that Allah is misguiding millions of Muslims, not because they're drinking alcohol or they're falling into zina, but because they want to watch an Islamic lecture? Well, I think that that point is Oham bin Bayt al-Ankabut. It's a very weak argument. The reason why I say it's, it's a weak argument is because, I mean, I, I, I heard priests and Christians, when they argue, they say, um, the same argument they say so you Muslims are trying to say that Allah was fooling the Christians when he changed Jesus into whoever he changed him into and he wanted to fool the Christians now, Allah has a way subhanahu wa ta'ala he tests his creation Allah tests subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way Allah tests subhanahu wa ta'ala is good and bad just because you have numbers doesn't indicate that you are upon the truth Okay. And it doesn't mean Allah is guiding or misguiding. Why? Expand on that. Because the Prophet ﷺ, as I said in the hadith, hmm. ﷺ, he said that the Ummah, 73 groups are going to all go to the hellfire, except one, one, not 72, are going to go into the hellfire. That one could be the biggest. That, 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 that goes against the, many of the textual evidences, which Allah wa says, وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ Little from my slaves are, show gratitude. Okay. The majority of the people don't know. Okay. If you obey the overwhelming majority of people, they will misguide you. Rather, the Messenger sallallahu he told us in a hadith, the hadith ibn Abbas, in Sahihain, the Prophet sallallahu he said, Their nations were presented to me. I saw a prophet and with him was a small number. I saw a prophet, he has one or two people with him. And then he saw, and he said, And I saw a prophet, There's no one with him. So what are we going to say now? That that prophet was misguiding the people? That his message was wrong? No, of course not. So we can't say that. Number doesn't really show anything. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and many of the Salaf, they said, You are the jama'ah even if you're by yourself. Number is nothing. If we take that argument, then the Christians should be, uh, the Christians should be uh, upon the haq. They are more, more than us in number. Yeah, okay, I agree. Do you think, uh, on a slight tangent, do you think your stance is a little bit immature? I've heard some other people who have also held the same stance as you, but they feel like they've grown out of it. They've matured, and therefore they've left that stance. You see, that's the, the sad reality. It's actually not maturity. That person hasn't matured. That's what my honest answer is. That person has actually gone astray. Yeah. And I said at the beginning of my discussion, The people who are turning away from this can only be, as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, If they don't obey you, Muhammad, in all of that which you said, then remember that they are following their desires. You see, I ask those same people questions. I surrender and I give in and I say, you know what? I am immature and your stance is maturity. Okay. Okay. How do I not know you're going to say 10 or 15 or 20 years from now that I was immature again? That stance of mine was wrong again. That my current stance is... Exactly. I see, because I've done it before. Exactly, you said it before. And this is a statement that uh, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentioned before. He said that the, from a person's destruction and from a person really being destroyed is that you accepted something once upon a time and you saw it to be good and now you're rejecting it. And the opposite, mm. you are uh, rejecting what you, want, what, what you once upon a time accepted. And then he said something powerful, he said, uh, What does that mean? Don't change colors. Don't become this and that. Mm. The religion of Allah is one. It doesn't make sense that you're changing so much but the religion is really one. But the reason they change is because their knowledge is growing. They're studying year on year, year on year. They're becoming more knowledgeable and they're seeing the errors of their previous ways. Some of these speakers have attended some of the most prestigious universities in the world. And they've continued to study after that and seen the errors of their past ways. It, not if they've studied in places that doubts have been brought forward to them and you know, they presented themselves to you know, shubhas and calamities and hardships and, and they've become misguided from that. That doesn't really mean that they've matured, what's happened to them is, is they've been indoctrinated and shaitan has, has, has had his way with him. Mm -hmm. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he told us, 
عليه الصلاة والسلام يا مقلب القلوب the one who tosses and turns the heart تبت قلبي على دينك أن ام القرآن الله سيد ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب you know, deviation happens people go and they change uh, you know واصل عطاء was from the students of Hassan al-Basri you know and he left Hassan al-Basri's gathering walked away from him how can someone so knowledgeable be misguided like that how can it happen I mean shaitan is if we say knowledge shaitan gathered the most knowledge I mean he's lived through everything he's he's been in Jannah he saw he heard he spoke to Allah Azza wa Jalla you see it's arrogance and stubbornness and this guidance that you have to understand is وَمَنْ يُهِنِ اللَّهُ فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ مُكْرِمْ if Allah chooses to humiliate you and not give you guidance then there's no one who can give it to you this is Allah is one willing I mean look at Abu Talib anyone better than Abu Talib in what he did for the Prophet his uncle his uncle Abu Talib Abu Talib made poetry for the Prophet. He said, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ بِأَنَّ دِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ دِينَ لَوْلَا الْمَلَامَةُ أَوْ حِدَارَ مُسَبَّتِ لَوَا جَتَّ لِي بِذَاكَ سَمْحَ مُبِينَ He said that, Muhammad, your religion, I would have taken it. I would have accepted it. If I wasn't scared of the blame of the blamers and those who are going to criticize me for it. You see? So, Abu Talib was boycotted from Quraysh for Nabilah Muhammad. He was thrown into a valley. He starved. He was boycotted. He went through hardship. And Allah said to the Prophet, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ Imagine if Nabi Muhammad is trying to, the truthful, the most honest, the most caring individual is giving you a message of Islam and you didn't take it from him. You've known him to be trustworthy. He is your son. And you choose not to take his message. To be honest, that person, would he take a message from a scholar, a student of knowledge? So it's not... It's not that the person has matured, to be very honest. Okay. It's, it's, and it's, it's giving it fancy names that I've matured out of this and I've become matured. It's like calling alcohol juice and it's called, calling drugs food and calling interest, uh, calling riba interest. When did it become interest? Allah is fighting with it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when they call it maturity, it's given a fancy name. And this is, a, this is, a, this is something known by shaitan. They give it a name other than it. The real name is misguidance. You've just become misguided. That's what's happened to you. You have not uh, become mature. How far do we take this? Because you mentioned at the start, before we spoke, you said that you mentioned a line of poetry which went something along the lines of everybody makes mistakes when they speak. So someone falls into a mistake. Someone falls into an error and we label him an innovator. Other people fall into mistakes. Other people fall into errors. And it's just a mistake. It, you know, it's, he's still from Ahlul Sunnah. Mm. Why is this contradiction present? You see, th that is a very good Good question. We look at نوعيتو الخطأ. We look at the type of mistake that the person falls into. Okay. There's no one who's free from mistakes. Wallahi, everyone is going to do mistakes. Everyone's going to come with shortcomings. You see, the issue isn't that the person just done a mistake. It's what type of mistake have they come with. So we look at that type of mistake. We, we observe it. We analyze it. We look at it. If that, if that mistake has reached innovation, and we deal with it like an innovation. What, what mistake? What kind of mistake? Give me an example of a mistake that reaches innovation. An aqidah mistake? A for example, a person says that, you know, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali are, you know, all in the hellfire, for instance. Okay. Or he says Abu Bakr and Umar are in the hellfire. That's, a, that's an extreme. That's, that's, an extreme a creed, that's a creedal issue, right? Yeah. So it's, it's a fundamental issue this person is going against, right? Yeah. So, um, or a person says, I don't want to take single narration in aqidah. Okay. Or The names and attributes of Allah, is this a fundamental issue? A fundamental issue. Imam and we fell into that? But we still call him from Ahlul Sunnah? Beautiful, this is a good question now. Now, you see, you're asking me a question of uh, whether we're going to apply this issue of taking a person out of the Sunnah or apply or not applying yeah. on uh, in no way. I'm talking about, first of all, ta'seel. Fundamentally, we have to first of all agree that going against Allah's names and attributes is an innovation. The second question is, does it apply to no way? Okay. Yeah, the first one we agree upon. So there's a, I want to bring a principle out of here, which is not every individual who falls into innovation is f everybody who does innovation is not an innovator. Not everybody who falls into or ev not everybody who does an innovation is an innovator. No. Well, explain what you mean by the that. The same is when a, everybody who does kufr is not a kafir. Okay, fine. Explain what you mean by that. Beautiful. If a person goes against Allah's names and attributes, yes, and they fall short on that, which is an innovation. It's an innovation. Okay. I said before to you that I, the the proof has to be established against them. So we have to go to them and tell them what they are upon is wrong and it's incorrect. Remember, there are two things that three points. Number one, if a person goes against Ahlul Sunnah in their source of evidence, where they take their evidence from, where they deduct their ruling from, which is it's called Mustar al Talaqi. It's Al Kitab, Was Sunnah, Wal Ijma'. The Quran, the Sunnah, and consensus. And the consensus. Okay. Those are the three evidences. Yeah, if someone. Quran evidence for it, for us following the Quran, the evidence that we need to follow the Quran is. 
Allah sabarak tabarak ta'ala is ayah where he says ittabi'u ma unzila ilaykum min rabbikum wa la tatabi'u min dunihi awliya follow that which has been sent to you from your lord and what, what has been sent from our lord is the quran and the sunnah both of them were sent from them because wa ma yantiqu 'anil hawa in huwa illa wahy yuha fa sunnatu an nabiy wahy thani 'alayhi ma qad utliqa al wahyani the sunnah is a second form of revelation pay attention the second the third thing is the consensus What's the evidence for consensus? وَمَنْ يُشَاقِلِ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّهُ وَنُسْلِهِ جَانَّمْ وَسَاعَةٍ مَصِيرًا English Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says anyone who goes against the path of the Prophet and the path of the Messenger mm. and the path of the believers when this ayah came down the believers was who? The companions Good So the f- going against what did Allah say after that? Then if you go against their path, then whichever destructive path that you've taken, we're going to keep you on that way. Meaning you're going to be upon your destruction and you're going to be upon your misguidance. You went against three things, the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the way of the early generation. Allah says in another ayah, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُمْ So again, Allah says, those who go and follow the muhajirin and the ansar. Allah said, I am pleased with the muhajirin, and I am pleased with the ansar, and I am pleased with those who follow them. Okay. So if you're not from, it, we're not the muhajirin, we, we, we didn't get that chance. And we're not from the ansar, so we can only be from the third option, which is to follow them. Okay. So if a person goes against Ahl Sunnah in those three, the Quran, the Sunnah, the Ijma', then we don't have to establish the proof against them. No problem. That's it. If a person gets, goes against Ahl Sunnah in five fundamental issues, the first one is Allah's names and attributes, okay. or he goes against Ahl Sunnah in the issues of the companions, or he goes against Ahl Sunnah, for instance, in the issues of promises, wa'ad wal wa'id, so Masail al Sma'il wa Sifat, Masail al Sahaba, the issue of al wa'ad wal wa'id, promises and, and, and warnings that are in the Quran, al Asma' wal Ahkam, names and rulings that are in the Quran, or the fifth, when, fifth is Qada and Qadar. Okay. If a person goes against Ahl, against Ahl Sunnah in those five, the proof needs to be established on it. Okay, so now we went against Ahl Sunnah in one of those five. Which is Allah's names and attributes. Yes, correct. But not in all its totality. He affirmed Allah is above his throne. No, we. Okay, there were certain aspects. But there were some characteristics, of course, in his Sharh of Sahih Muslim, in which he did do ta'wil in, which he didn't go according to the Salaf regarding it. But we will say that that is a mistake that came from Nawawi. But we won't say that he fell into innovation. Why? Because the person who says that would have to prove to me that the proof was established against Nawawi and he chose not to follow it. We're saying that in all the years Imam Nawawi was alive and giving da'wah to Islam and being involved in Islam, the truth wasn't established against him? You believe that? Of course, I'm going to have to have husn al of him. I see a man who's explaining the second most authentic book. I see a man who wrote serving the hadith of the Prophet I saw a man who dedicated his life to explaining the textual evidences. That being said, he really loved and was passionate about the Sunnah of the Prophet. Yes. That being said, okay. if a person wants to take him out of Ahlul Sunnah on a fundamental thing, he went against Ahlul Sunnah, which is one of the five, he would have to clearly prove to me that no way, the proof was established and he became stubborn from it. Okay, if he doesn't, okay. I'm not going to base it on speculation and all those years. Beautiful. And it clearly be proved to me that it was established on him. Beautiful. I apply the same thing to the speaker that we were speaking about earlier. Sahih. Who is not, who is not calling his tawheed as much as you'd like him to, but he's also not open in innovation. Uh, why can't we use the same khusnudan for him? Has Beautiful. this proof been established against him? Have you spoken that, to that, him? That's the point now. Yeah, Jamil, I agree with you. If a speaker is speaking and he falls, against, he falls short on a concept from the usul of Ahlul Sunnah, the proof needs to be established on him. Okay. Tuqamu alayhi hujja the proof needs to be established on him and the mahajja, whatever is blinding him, needs to be removed from him. If that hasn't been done, then no one has any rights to label him as an innovator. Okay. And when we're talking about someone who is not calling to tawheed as much as you'd like, which one of those five does this fall into? As in? As in, we have, we have a speaker who is, his main da'wah is not uh, calling to tawheed, but he's calling to other good deeds. Mm-hmm. And you said to be an innovator, you have to fall in a position to one of these five things. So he's going against Masail al-Asma' wal ahkam because the word da'wah is a shari term okay. used in the sharia. It has a definition. It means to call the people to Allah Azza wa Jalla and not to call the people to yourself so you can get more followers. Mm-hmm. Because the ayah says, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِ أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ I call the people to Allah, not yourself. Okay. So if I, see your, if I see you calling to yourself, then I think there's a big flaw in your da'wah. You need to be calling to Allah. And what does it mean calling to Allah? You're calling to his rububiyyah, you're calling to his uluhiyyah, you're calling to his asma' wa sifat. You don't have to use those terms that I just used. You don't have to use those terms. But you just have to use the concept that's behind those terms. Okay, 
Okay, I understand. Well, now we're talking about someone who is openly calling to the innovation. According to your stance, we are not allowed to take knowledge from them. Agreed? No. no. Okay, then why was I in your class and you were teaching on Waraqat? By Imam Abu Ali joining. Yes. Two responses. First of all, Shaykh well, was... Sorry, just to clarify, he was not just an Ash'ari, he was the head of, of the Ash'ari. Ash'ari. So let's, let me make something clear. Nawawi is not an Ash'ari. Okay. Like in Abi Hamid al, uh, Abi Hamid al Ghazali, Abi Ma'ali al Juwaini, and Fakhruddin al Razi, and Abu Bakr ibn Fawrak, and Abu Bakr al Baqilani, these are Ash'ari. Okay. Like in Nawawi is not Ash'ari, Ibn Hajar is not an Ash'ari, and Bayhaqi are not Ashari. Okay, and you taught Al Walaqat, which is one of the ones that you just said is an Ash'ari. It's just sah, true. Okay, how do you explain this? Two responses. The first response that Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah gave was that Al Imam Abi, Abi Ma'ali al Juwaini did repent at his last moments. Okay. So that's one statement. Even that though that itself min min al to be very honest, Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah's statement fihi nadar. There is a look to it. Because he only repented from uh, one form of innovation to another form of innovation. Which was what? He left ta'wil and he went to tafwil. So he's still an innovator. So he still so it doesn't help you. Yeah, so I but Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah did say that. Okay, fine. Um, the second thing is a concept that we need to understand now. You asked me, can a person go and take knowledge from an innovator? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I said to you what? You said no. I said to you no. Jamil. Now, because the asal is that it's not permissible. Okay. The asal is what? It's not permissible. It's not permissible. Every issue that we give a general ruling for, there are exceptions. Okay. And you can never use those exceptions to dismiss and dismantle and push away the foundation that we've agreed on. I'll give you an example. Is drinking alcohol haram? Yes. What about if a person is in a moment where they have to drink alcohol? It's a necessity. What about if I use that as an argument and say that khamr is now permissible in this situation? Show it should permiss- it's generally permissible now. Mm-hmm. And I make that a general ruling. It's not now. So when we use the books of the innovators in situations that the scholars have seen that this book, even though the author is an innovator, mm-hmm. but what is being taught here, what is within this book, has not got a problem for the people to study it. There's not a problem. Because the truth, remember, is a lost property of the believer. So you take the good and you leave the bad, is what you're saying. But th- when we say take the good and take the bad, we're mm-hmm. saying that the person can determine what is good from what is bad. Yeah, agreed. Otherwise, you can't. Otherwise, you so can't. You might fall into the bad if you can't determine. Okay, I agree. So if you say to me that a, a student of knowledge who's now starting to seek knowledge, he should take, he can take the good from an innovator and you know leave off the bad that is with him, then I would say, he, is he a student or is he the teacher? So how does he know what is good from what is bad? Okay, I agree with you. And it goes against the concept of a student towards his teacher anyways. Why would you seek knowledge from somebody who you believe is misguided in the first place? I say the same thing about al-Waraqat. Th- th- that's the point. You're not taking waraqat because of the author who wrote it. You're taking waraqat because the people of the Sunnah told you to read it. Okay. But here you're sitting under a person of innovation. No one's told you. No, you can't determine what is right from what is wrong. You're a student of knowledge. I think this is Qiyas and Ma'al Fariq. You're using two different situations and you're trying to give the same ruling towards it. Okay, I agree with you that if obviously if you're not knowledgeable enough to determine what is good and what is bad, then you can't do that because you might fall into the bad. I Plus, why would you even want to? That you've got many people who teach this subject anyways. You can study Arabic from somebody else or you can t- study well, that, opens, that opens up the door to another issue. Uh, the Al-Walaqat, for example, is a, a kitab in Usul al-Fiqh. Mm. Why are we still relying on quote-unquote innovators in sciences are so, so important like Usul al-Fiqh. Mm. Have we not got anyone from Ahlul Sunnah to learn this from? But I'm not going to be taking the book itself. I'm taking the shuruh and explanation of the people of the Sunnah. But I think the point I really want to draw here is that, you know, uh, a book that a scholar or, or a person of innovation wrote, and that book itself has been uh, told by people of Sunnah. They said, this book, we've looked at it, we've, we've verified it, we checked it. Even though the author is wrong, you can study it. And these are the points that we've underlined. Then comparing that to going to the door of Khalid or Zaid or Bakr, min and nasi from the people, who no one's told you who he is, you just sat with him, and you take knowledge from him, and you're a beginner. And so you're saying, I know he's got innovation, but I'm only going to what? Take the good and leave the evil. Yeah. But then that's the question. Should you even sit with somebody who you, you're questioning his aqidah, you're questioning your own teacher. Should you question your teacher in the first place? What, isn't that bad manners? Yeah, it is. Isn't that, and the poet did say, وكل ما لم يعتقد لم ينتفع. If you don't believe in your teacher and you don't have faith in him, to be very honest, you don't benefit from him. It's when you lack faith in your teacher, that's when you tend to not benefit from him the way you should. 
Therefore, the same can be said about the Arabic language. It's just a language. We could go to a non-Muslim university and learn Arabic as a language. Therefore, what's the harm in taking it from an... See, this is the difference. Taking knowledge from the disbeliever and taking knowledge from the innovator. Again, it's a different, different Which is situation. Worse. The, the disbeliever, I'm not taking a religious concept from him. Aslan. You, you might be taking atheism from him. Oh, well, I'm not allowed to then study from him. Then you're not allowed to? No, of course. Every disbeliever comes with baggage. Oh, I can, I Christianity, can, Judaism, atheism, something. Yeah, like. I cannot study from a person who's teaching me corruption in my belief. Even a language. He's not teaching you your belief. He's teaching you a language. And he's bringing doubts to me. No, not necessarily. He's just teaching you, teaching you a language. So Arabic, for example. Uh, can, we take that, can, we take, can we learn Arabic from an innovator? You see, you're asking me a specific situation for a general ruling. Okay. I would, I would say to you, no, it's not allowed. As a general ruling? Yeah, but there could be a particular person I might say to them, you can go, go study there. Why is it not allowed? We're just learning a language. It doesn't stay as a language because it, the person is a Muslim. Yes. A person who's a Muslim is closer to you than a, than a non-Muslim. Okay. So you kind of, he will, he will push you, he will give you that feeling. He's a Muslim brother of yours that has salams, you give him salams. Second thing is, I mentioned the statement of Imam Shawkani rahimahullah ta'ala where it, does, it weakens the heart. It weakens the what? The heart to his statements. So when he brings an Arabic example and he brings the ayah al-Rahmanu ala al arsh istawa, let's say the word istawa means istawa and he throws that in. And you're just a young, basic Arabic learner or he tells you that the kalam, inna al-kalam ala fil fu'adi wa inna ma ju'ila lisanu li ma fil fu'adi dalila that speech doesn't come out, it's what's inside you, kalamun nafsi and you just take that in, you take it in. Even al-warqat, a person shouldn't study al-warqat by themselves. They should be taught al-warqat by a person of the sunnah who will correct the book and tell you what's right from what is wrong in it. I don't think anybody would go and open al-warqat by themselves and understand what's being said there. So are you really studying al-warqat or are you studying from a person of the sunnah? Okay, understood. Um, do you think your stance is a little harsh? And especially when I, what I mean by that is applying it in the modern day world. According to you, you shouldn't take knowledge from an innovator. You shouldn't even sit with an innovator. Some of my family members, potentially, as an example, methylene, may be classified according to you as an innovator. I can't sit with them. Well, I befriend them in the worldly issues that you need to deal with them. They have rights of a relative with you. Karaba, la shak. Your family members, they have rights on you, even if they're the worst of the worst. They have rights on you in the sense that karaba that doesn't go. But they lose the allegiance and the, bro and the religious connection with you anymore. The minute you, f you see a person from Africa, the other side of the world, mm. from where you're from, who's holding on to the sunnah, is more closer to you than your, your misguided family member, for instance. Your brother, who's misguided. That doesn't mean that you cut the ties of kinship. See, we can't dismiss one evidence for the other. Okay, you have to Allah says, فَهَلَا عَسَيْتُمْ إِنْ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ أَنْ تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَطِّعُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ You can't cut the ties of kinship with your family. I mean, the disbeliever that Allah wa ta'ala says, وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِي عِلْمٌ فَلَا تُطَعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا Befriend them in good, even if they're telling you to go against Allah's religion. Befriend them in good. In other words, whatever good that's there, befriend them. Whenever it isn't anything to befriend them with, just leave them. How many members? Yeah. So that's my answer. But it doesn't dismiss the concept of, and the consensus that I brought to you, that the Salaf brought, to stay away from the innovators. So if your brother, for example, yeah. is preaching innovation to you, you don't say he's my brother, I'm going to sit with him, I have to sit with him. No, you walk away from him, you don't sit with him. But tomorrow you go to him, and you greet him, and you ask him how his children are doing, and you leave him again. No. Okay, how far do we take this? For example, you have someone who is openly upon the Sunnah, but they might do conferences with people who are questionable. Mm. Do we boycott him? Is he a person now, a person of innovation? You see, if a person is calling to the sunnah yeah. and he warns against innovation and he's known for his views to be upright and steadfast and he's in accordance to that which the pious predecessors were upon, we may differ on an individual. Okay. We might differ on this person whether these principles apply on this person or not. I might say Bakr is a dis he's a mubtadi, dalun mudil, he's a misguided person. And you Shahid might say, well, I don't see that applying on him. You've misunderstood it. Maybe Abdul Rahman, I think you have a personal issue against him. Now, just because we've differed on the application of these texts on this particular person, doesn't mean we've differed upon the principles. Okay, yeah, I understand that, I agree. So that's happened in the time of the Salaf. They differed on the individuals. You find that Imam Shafi'i would praise this person, and then you find that Imam Ahmed 
criticize that person. And the general principle for this kind of situation, someone who is upon the sunnah but doing conferences with other people who are questionable, the general principle is? You no, know, he shouldn't. He shouldn't do that. He shouldn't. But he doesn't even agree with you that this person is an innovator in the first place. He doesn't agree with you. Uh, clarify that for me. I don't understand. The people he's doing the conference with. So you're agree. saying that, exactly. So my point is that you're saying that pe a person should not work with an innovator, correct? Yeah, this is what I'm saying, you're saying. So if me and you both agree that this person is an innovator and then yeah. you're working with him, that's yeah. now a problem. That's a problem. But you're saying, I don't believe this person is an innovator, Aslan. Okay. I do believe that if a person says this, 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 this is the innovator. But I don't believe this person said that. And I, I'm saying, no, I believe he said it. Do you see my point? Yeah, so there's, there could be a situation where the person who's working with the people in the conference, he doesn't believe them to be innovators, but you do. Yeah. And therefore you think, ah, oh, you're... But we don't differ on principle, me and this person. Okay, yeah, okay. Me okay. and this person, we both agree, for instance, that you can't go against an oppressive leader who's not a disbeliever. Okay. We both agree on that. Okay? Okay. And that's something, mutual agreement, both of us. But there's a person he's going to do a conference with, and that person he's going to do the conference with believes that you can go against the leader in a what? If he's an oppressive leader. Okay. I then said to Akhi, don't go with, to that person because it's what he believes. He says to me, I don't agree with this. Right, right. Your application... No, not that I don't agree with the principle. I, I agree the I principle is misguided. I don't agree that the, this brother believes this. That's mutually... That's happened. You can't change that. That's happened through Islamic history. That has happened through the time of the Salaf. They differed on individuals. Like, for, I, can be, I can give you many examples. Yahya ibn is criticizing Imam Shafi'i. Mm. Ahmed ibn Hamad did not accept that from him. See my point? Yeah, yeah. And Imam Bukhari was criticized by Yahya al Duhali. No one accepted it from him. Um, it's happened, okay. people have misplaced particular rulings on people. That has happened, there's no denying of that. Okay. But if you and I start discussing whether going against oppressive leader, for instance, who's not a disbeliever, is an oppressive leader, you believe that's you can. Now I have a problem with you because of what you believe. The asal that you believe is wrong. Okay, fine. So if there is a masjid, for example, that is clearly upon innovation, and we agree that they're upon innovation, I can't cooperate with them. We shouldn't, we shouldn't cooperate with them. We shouldn't give da'wah to them. Oh, you should definitely give da'wah to every and every person. That's what okay. the ayah we mentioned. But not a joint conference where we're together, we're sitting next to each other. No, you shouldn't promote shouldn't them, and you shouldn't engage with them, and you shouldn't. No, definitely you shouldn't. But, what do you but there are times, I told you, situations that may arise I want this to be put in correct context. Okay. There may arise masalih amma for the Muslims. A great benefit for the Muslims. Okay. Where Muslims are losing their masajid. And this is causing a problem to the Muslim community. So they come together and they voice their opinion to push this away and repel it against themselves as a joint force to remove this. This la shaka can fall under wa ta'awanu ala al-birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awanu ala al wa al But you as an individual, don't believe that the Dio Bundy and the Brailwi and all of these are guided. You believe they're misguided. They're upon innovation. They are from the 72 in the, in the Hellfire. That's what you believe. Mm. That's your belief. But I'm working with them right now because of uh, the truth. Yeah. I'm trying to spread haq. The haq is what's going to prosper, prosper here. I'm not doing it for this person. I'm trying to repel a harm that is there that I think should be removed. That is shar'i. The Prophet did that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he did it with the non-Muslims. He did it with Quraysh. He signed a treaty with them. And Ibn al-Qayyim, who I don't think anybody should question his knowledge, had said that. He took from that. But when you say a person is not calling to the Sunnah, he's not calling to Tawheed, he doesn't preach the Haqq, he only talks about generic issues. Mm. And then I see him every conference, he's with the Obandis, he's with the Brailwis, he's with them. And he goes, we have to look at the unity of the Muslims. I now really question you. What are you about? Okay. What are you talking about? Because I don't see from your message, Da'watul Anbiya wa Rasul, the message that the Prophets and the rightly guided came with. We don't have Husnadan that he's given da'wah to those people? That doesn't dismiss the fact that he's not calling to the message of Al Islam in the way that the Prophet did. It comes back to that point, doesn't it? It, it? Definitely. Your message is your message itself. Before you we talk about who you're associating with. You yourself, your message is not what the message of the Prophet was. Are you with me? Yeah. I mean, like, look at Nabilah uh, Yusuf. He's in prison. The, the prisoners that were in prison with Yusuf, they saw a dream. And when they saw the dream, they asked him for the interpretation of the dream. Nabilah Yusuf did not give them the response and he didn't give them the interpretation of the dream until he said what? 
يا صاحبي السجن ارباب متفرقون خير ام الله الواحد القهار he spoke straight away he said before i answer your question توحيد توحيد okay i still feel like you hold a very very harsh staunch view according to you we can't differ on anything in the religion we always have to be this we have to be robotic and agree on every single thing what can we differ on what no no definitely that's not what i'm saying and Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says in the Quran وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكَ The people are going to differ. Differences is you and I, black and white. Mm. You know, there's, there's, there's differences. Allah says وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَةِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ I speak a different language to you. Differences is there. Now, every difference is, is madmoon, blameworthy. Okay. So what are the permissible types of differences? Beautiful. That's the good thing now. The difference that we consider to be difference is that which does not po oppose another textual evidence. It, also, it is not something that is strange, that hasn't been heard of, nor has been brought forward by the pious predecessors. Okay. So if you're taking an opinion, within the time of the Salaf, they had two, three views in this issue. You chose one of those views and we differed. Then that issue is a difference of opinion, which is valid. It's called khilaf, ama, it's called ijtihad, more like, sa'ikh. And so I, on the other hand, meaning? meaning permitted, okay. meaning acceptable. One of us is wrong and one of us is right. I, we just can't put our thumb. Each one is saying, of course, my one is right. Yeah. But it gives us that, that right to love one another, to actually say, you know what? You got Ibn Mas'ud in this issue, and I have Ibn Abbas in this issue. Prime example. Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Abbas differed upon an interpretation of a verse. Oh, la mastum nisa the ayah. What does it mean in this ayah? Mm. Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Abbas had two different in tafsir. Okay. Ibn Mas'ud said, here lams means um, touching a woman. Ibn Mas'ud said that. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, it means sexual intercourse. So that means, that the woman, if, she, if you touch a woman, she'll break a wudu, according to Ibn Mas'ud's interpretation. And according to Ibn Abbas, no, it doesn't, only it has to be sexual intercourse with a woman. Okay. Now, somebody takes the view of Ibn Mas'ud and someone takes the view of Ibn Abbas. Of course, I'm of the view of Ibn Abbas. And that's the view I'm going to push and that's the view I'm going to, you know. Yeah. But on the other hand, I won't say that the person who takes the view of Ibn Mas'ud is misguided, he's corrupted, he's, he should be you know, boycotted for that belief. No, that's a khila, that's a jtihad dun sa'ir. It's a difference of opinion which is valid and it's present at the time of the Salaf and Shafi'i and the Madhab Imam Shafi'i, this is what they took, this is acceptable. The other issue is, for example, do you put your knees down or do you put your hands down first when you go towards to, 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 to the sujood? That's another difference okay. of opinion okay. which is valid. Okay, fine. But we can't differ upon whether khamar is halal or haram. Yeah, I see, because that difference hasn't occurred before us. Exactly. Okay, but at the same time, with your kind of view, and uh, particularly when it comes to dealing with innovators, don't you feel like you're restricting yourself to maybe three or four shuyukh in the world, and you're being fanatical towards them? Whoever they declare to be an innovator, you're with them. No, that's not the case. And there are people who are like that, I agree, okay. but I'm definitely not like that. I actually believe that ulama of the sunnah are all, all, all over the world. Some who I know and some I don't know. And the ones that I know, are, I hope, are more than the ones I know. And I actually believe that if a person, he bases his love and his hate, his allegiance on individuals, then that person is actually an innovator himself. Okay. And I'm going to read the statement of Imam Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah said, فَمَنْ جَعَلَ شَخْصًا مِنَ الْأَشْخَاصِ Anyone who takes a particular person, غَيْرَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ other than the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم مَنْ أَحَبَّهُ Anyone who loves that person, وَوَافَقُ and agrees with that person, كَانَ مِنْ أَهْلُ السُنَّةِ He says, oh yeah, he's from Ahl why? Because he agrees with my shaykh. Mm. Yeah. Anyone who does that and says, you're Ahlul Sunnah because you agreed with our shaykh, you agreed with our imam. Anyone who does that, Shaykh Al-Islam Taymiyyah said. وَمَنْ خَالَفَ And anyone who opposes that shaykh, you say he's an innovator because he opposed the shaykh. وَمَنْ خَالَفَ وَكَانَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْبِدْعَةِ وَالْفُرْقَةِ That you're an innovator. You're causing disunity to the ummah because you went against our imam. كَمَا يُوجَدُ ذَلِكَ فِي طَوَائِفِ as it has, it, this is present in some deviated groups in the religion right. and other than that كَانَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْبِدَعِ وَالضَّلَالِ وَالتَّفَرُّقِ You are from the innovators now. You this are misguided. Of course they are. 
Anyone who bases love and hate on other than the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that which the Ummah have unanimously agreed upon, anyone who bases love and hate on other than the Quran and the Sunnah and that which the Ummah have united upon, then he is from min ahli al-bida'i wal-dalali wal-furqah. Okay. Amma wa tafarruq he is a person of the, whether he screams I'm from the people of the Sunnah and I am from the Imams of the Sunnah and I'm upon Salafiyya and I'm this and that. He can give himself those fancy names. He is an innovator himself. He is misguided himself and he is from Ahlul Furqa, those Ahlul Tafarruq. So that's something I really want people to understand. There are scholars of the Sunnah in India. There are scholars in the Sunnah in Europe. There are scholars in the Sunnah in America. Europe. All of it, I don't know them. I can't, okay, I cannot right. eliminate everything. Yeah. There, could, there could be scholars of Sunnah in America. There could be scholars in China. There could be scholars in Australia. There could be scholars of the Sunnah in, what do you call it, Africa. I can't speak. Okay. And just because I don't know something, as the ulama, they say, just because you're ignorant of something, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Your ignorance of something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So I'm saying that, alhamdulillah, the people of the Sunnah are a lot. They don't have to sign up. They don't have to call a particular person. They don't have to sign a, a, a letter of agreement. All that they need to come with is they have to follow the Quran and the Sunnah and every interpretation they give for the Quran and the Sunnah has to be based on what the Sahaba said. Okay. That's all it is. Even if you don't call yourself, for example, Salafi. You don't have to call yourself Salafi. Wallahi, you don't have to call yourself Salafi. No, no, you don't have to call yourself Ahl Sunnah if you want to. Rather, if you call yourself Salafi and you don't follow the Quran and the Sunnah and that which the pious predecessors is upon, and you give yourself a Salafi, you're not Salafi. The name doesn't change anything. La okay. the scholars they say, La bil alfadi wal mabani. There's no reality to wordings and terms. Inna al-ibratu bil maani. That which we look at is the meaning. We look at your action. We look at how do you follow the Salaf. Are your actions like there are a group of people who say I'm Salafi right now and they shout that we're Salafi. But for them, the reality and the truth is they have love and they have hate and they have allegiance on a particular person or a particular or two, three shaykh shuks. There's no debate about that. That's the truth. That's the reality. Though, you know what you can do? You can oppose if you want to. The Salaf. You can oppose the Salaf if you want to. But if you don't oppose, if you, if you, but if you agree with their shaykh, you're from the Ahlul Sunnah, you're from Fiqhatul Najiyah and you're Salafi. That's the reality of some group of people out there. This shaykh is also one of your shaykhs. I mean, I respect the shuyukhs of Ahlul Sunnah in general. And that doesn't mean I agree with everything a person okay. says. I don't believe every single person a shaykh says that he's haq and he is... I don't believe that. I believe yu'khadu min qawli wa yurad. I take some of his speech when he goes in accordance to the kitab and the sunnah and I reject it when he goes against the kitab and the sunnah. I have not got fan... I'm not fanatic over any individual. Okay, Jazakallah Khayyun Ustad Abdul Rahman. I've got one more really important question for you, and I'm going to end with this bit in the Lahul Kareem. And that is, what if you are a layman Muslim? You're not knowledgeable. You find someone in the masjid giving dudus, giving lectures, lectures, giving lessons, and you see them reading the Quran, praying at night. You see them doing all of these good deeds. He's got beautiful akhlaq, good manners, and he's calling people to what appears to you as a layman Muslim to the right version of Islam. How can you determine whether your initial perception of them being upon the Sunnah is correct or not? What kind of steps can you take? What kind of, you know, what kind of guidelines can you use? You see, the Jalain person who doesn't know, generally we can't hold him account because he's ignorant, right? He doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, ignorance is a udur shar'i. Ignorance, generally speaking, is a shar'i excuse. You are excused. In the Sharia, yeah. ignorance is an excuse. As Allah said, Even from, from Tawheed. You see, that's, 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 that's a, that, that needs tafsil, whether you can be ignorant in Tawheed. Okay. Yeah. That's, another, that's another topic for another day. That's another topic for another day. Okay. So Allah wa Ta'ala, He says in the Quran, We are not ones to punish them unless we send a messenger to them. Mm -hmm. Meaning to convey to them. Allah says in another ayah, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهِ حَقَّ قَدْرِي إِذْ قَالُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى بَشَرِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ and Allah said in another ayah, Allah yastafi min al malaikatu rusul wa min al nas. Allah sent messengers for a reason to convey the message of Islam and to debunk uh, and to speak against and dismantle the, the confusion and the misinterpretation of religion. So ignorance is a hook, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a valid excuse. 
generally now. Okay. But here, if a person goes to a person who they rely and they believe in Amatul Nas, and they believe in that person, then as a poet said, وَلَيْسَ فِي فَتْوَاهُ مُفْتِ الْمُتَّبِعِ مَا لَمْ يُضَفْ لِلْدِّينِ الْعِلْمِ وَالْوَرَعِ أَمَا وَالْوَرِعِ The person, he is... He goes to a person he sees religion in, he sees a person who's you know, staying away from haram, he sees a person who he believes is acting upon the religion, that's all he saw, and he asks question. I mean, Allah is not going to punish him for that. But what is needed to know is, and this is an advice to all of the people out there who are seeking knowledge, want to learn, it's generally good to go to a person of the sunnah and you ask them about who you should take knowledge from. So you can test them, ask them. You don't test the person that you're trying to take knowledge from, but you just ask about him from other people. Just like a sister, if she wanted to get married, she asks about the brother. But as a layman, like how can you determine whether the answer you get is a good answer or not? I mean, you hear from the imams of your local masjid, all of them are criticizing him. They all say mm. that he's misguided. Okay, okay. I mean, I want to mention a final story, and I think this, inshallah ta'ala, should, it should, inshallah ta'ala, bring matters to more clarity, and I think it's important that we mention it. And Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala, I took this story from Tabaqat al Hanabila by Abu Ya'la. Okay. He mentioned that Al Imam Ahmad said to Ali ibn Abi Khalid, he said about Al Harith al Mahasibi, he said about him, La tu jalisu, don't sit with him. Wa la tu kalimu, don't talk to him. So, this is what Al Imam Ahmad said to him. He said, don't sit with that man and don't even talk to him. He's talking about an innovator. A man who went against. I want to, I want to show you something. Okay. And then Imam Ahmad also said to the neighbor and a man who's close to Ali ibn Abi Khalid the same thing. And he argued with Imam Ahmad more than the other, the, more than uh, Ali ibn Abi Khalid. He argued with him regarding the issue of Al-Harith. He said, ذاك لا يعرف إلا من خبره عرفه ذاك جالسه المغازلي مغازلي نعم مغازلي ويعقوب وفلان فأخرجهم إلى رأي جهم هلكوا بسببه. أحمد هذا اسمه لأ يأسك من بعد حارث. Many people have sat with him and he's taken, he's taken them away from the Sunnah. He's thrown them into misguidance. He corrupted their belief. So the man said to him, يا أبا عبد الله. This is what concerns me. He said to Ahmed, Ahmed, يروي الحديث. The man is narrating hadiths. Sakin and the man is tranquil. The man has humility when he talks. Just like the people I'm telling you about who yeah. call to reading the Quran and doing good deeds. He said, Yarwil Haditha. Okay. He narrates hadith. Sakin Khashi'un. This man has khushu in his prayer. He's calm and he's collected. He has the, the scent of ulama. He has he is like a scholar. And he he went on explaining who this man is. Abu Abdullah Ahmed got angry. وَجَعَلَ يَقُولُ He said, لَا يَغُرَّكَ Don't let it deceive you. خُشُوعُهُ This man is خُشُوع. وَلِينُ And how gentle he is. لَا تَغْتَرَّ بِتَنْكِيسِ رَأْسِ Don't let his, him looking down like this and humbling himself. Don't let that fool you. فَإِنَّ رَجُلُ صُوِنْ This man is an evil man. ذَاكَ لَا يَعْرِفُ إِلَّا مَنْ قَدْ خَبَرَهُ لَا تُكَلِّمُ وَلَا كَرَامَةُ No one knows this man unless the person who sees him, who saw him for, who, for what he really is. لَا تُكَلِّمُ Don't talk to this man. وَلَا كَرَامَةَ لَهُ This man has no honor. There's no good in him. كُلُّ مَنْ حَدَّثَ بِحَدِيثِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Everyone who tells you the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَكَانَ مُبْتَدِعَ And he's an innovator. تَجْلِسُ إِلَيْهِ You're going to sit with him? Every person who tells you a hadith of the Prophet and he's an innovator, you're going to go and you're going to take hadith from him? لا. Ahmed said, no. وَلَا كَرَامَةَ This man has no honor. وَلَا نُعْمِ عَيْنٍ وَجَعَلَ يَقُولُ ذَاكَ ذَاكَ And Ahmed kept going on. This man is, this man is, this man is. And he was angry. So just because you saw a man praying and mm. fasting and you know, crying in the salah and whenever he mentions a hadith, he can't hold himself. That doesn't make it a criteria to go forward for marrying him. Or taking knowledge from him. Or taking knowledge from him. And to be very frank and honest with you, a sister wouldn't just take that as well for marriage. And that's what really shocks me. That if I told you he's dangerous, stay away from him, you would take it. Mm. And you'd be very... But when it comes to this person's an innovator, this person's going to corrupt your religion, you are what? You're like, nah. And what is most important for you, your Rasul, your Rasul Mal is your, your deen, your deen, your deen, your religion. Rasul Mal meaning? Meaning your capital. Yeah. You cannot, you can't lose the capital, right, in a business. And no, uh, you go bust. Yeah, so you're losing your deen and you're talking about other things. It's sad that nowadays that people will really be careless about whether a person is innovator or not. To the extent, I'll tell you something. 
There are people who now don't even like using the word bid'ah. Hate using that word bid'ah. They hate using the word sunnah. They hate using the word tawheed. They've run away from it so much, and there will come a time they don't want to even use the word Allah. Ustad, I think we're going to leave it there. Jazakallah khairan for joining me on the hot seat. Jazakallah. May Allah bless you. Anak al-Bok al-Hamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha la ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. I hope you enjoyed and benefited from that discussion. Please do share it with your friends and family members if you feel like they might benefit too. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button below so you're notified of any new episodes. Check out www.thehotseatpodcast.com. That's thehotseatpodcast.com. On there, you'll find a little bit more information about the podcast and you'll also have the chance to vote for which topic you'd like to see discussed on the show. You can also ask questions on the website to the speaker himself about these contemporary modern day issues. Until next time, fi imalillahi wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.